Welcome to Music and Medicine. Welcome to Music and Medicine. Welcome to Music and Medicine. I'm your host, Dr. Moshe Lewis. Welcome to Music and Medicine. I'm your host, Dr. Moshe Lewis. I'm excited and so delighted to be joined by Beverly Todd, seasoned actress, 50 years going back to Lean On Me with Morgan Freeman. She's worked with Sidney Poitier. She's worked in so many films and currently is in the hit Fox series 911, playing the character of Beatrice, Angela Bassett's mom. Thanks so much for joining us. 50 years? What? <laughs> How wow. did it fly by? How do you look so good? That's the first secret we got to ask you. I have a mirror, <laughs> and I look in it. Yeah, I and makeup it. is magic. Sure. Yeah. Well, I don't think it's all makeup. <laughs> it runs in the genes. But just tell us about some of that work. I mean, these are legends as well that you've worked with, and sort of what are just some of your great moments with people like Sydney? You know, people often ask me, what's your favorite movie and what's your favorite actor? Who's and it's an impossible question to answer because yeah. I've been fortunate to work with some major, major stars. Yeah. For instance, Sidney Poitier was my mentor. Yeah. He's the one who uh, said, Slim, you're going to come and work with me and I'm going to have this great career for you. And I said, okay. Um, and um, we did uh, the first... The, after the very first film, he, he and, and I didn't have to audition. He just, uh, but because look, I had already starred in, in London in No Strings. Right. Richard Rogers, I auditioned, I guess it might be 50 years, I auditioned for Richard Rogers <laughs> for the original uh, London production of No Strings. Right. And I had uh, starred there and then I came back here and uh, Sidney Poitier was directing his first Broadway musical. Yes. And the whole town was all the actors, oh my God, Sidney Poitier. And I got a call to go in on audition and I said, okay, because it was Sidney. I, I, I felt, look, I just came back from starring in London. Well, why should I have to audition, you know? But I did and I got a call the next day. They said, well, they want you. And I said, great. They said, but they want you to understudy. I said, what? I said, no. oh, no, 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 no. I just got through starring in London. I'm not understudy. Okay. And my manager said, well, Beverly, but it's Sidney Poitier. You know, you don't know where it could lead. I said, I don't care. I mean, that's great, but I'm not going to do it. Wow. Two days later, something said to me, you better go and do that show. Sure. I called my manager. I said, is it still available? She called, and there I was. I shouldn't say auditioning, I was understudying. And I said, well, who got the role? And of course, she and I, our whole careers, we were competing against each other, and it was Cicely Tyson. Mm, wow. So anyway, Cicely is a great actress, but she doesn't have to, you know, comedy and, and dramatic is different. Mm. And Cicely was a great actress, but she didn't have the comedy timing, the chops for it. The show opened and it closed, well, it didn't close, but they didn't get good reviews. It closed the following week. Sure. I got a call after the night after the opening, and my manager said, they want you to come and do the show. I said, now? Right. After all the reviews are in, after the critics have all been there, I said, what, 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 what's the point? And she said, probably just do it. And I said, okay. Mm. So I went in and had a wonderful week with Sydney and the cast. Sure. Um, uh, there was an actor by the name of um, Bobby Brown. I don't know if you remember him, and that's not really his name. I can't think of his name now. But anyway, it's Louis Gossett, um, um, uh, Diana Ladd, myself, and all oh, this is terrible that I can't think of his name now. Anyway, it was a five-character comedy, and sure. it was really great. It was wonderful. The audience, I thought, well, are they going to boo when they see me and not Cicely? And I, they didn't. They, they, they accepted me. I got great applause at the end of each show. So that's how I first met Sidney. And after that, he saw my potential and said that he was going to mentor me, and that's how my relationship with Sidney started. Sure. What have you enjoyed the most about being on film and being on camera and doing so many great films? Well, I've loved all of it because I worked with Sidney. I starred with Richard Pryor as his wife in moving. Come on. Yes. I starred with Whoopi Goldberg and Clarice Hart. Neil, in fact, you know, you're right. You keep I keep thinking about this 50 years. <laughs> you <laughs> you put it in my mind, it's Sorry. your fault. <laughs> Neil Patrick Harris about 12 or something, maybe even younger when we did Clara's Heart. Yes. Neil Patrick Harris is almost 50. Sure. You know, I know. Oh yes. my, ooh, okay. That's too much <laughs> information. Okay. Sure. Um, so I work with, sit with uh, um, uh, who was I talking about? Uh, uh, Richard Pryor. Yes. 
Whoopi Goldberg, and on and on and on. So I work with so many. Uh, Louis Gossett, of course, I started with him. Yeah. Morgan Freeman, yeah. I worked with him and did Lean on Me and The Bucket List. Yes. So it's been like a roller coaster ride of wonderful actors and wonderful roles, and I've loved them all. They've all been so different. It's impossible to choose. Sure. What do you think are some of the greatest challenges in maintaining over time, be it the work, the intensity, the schedule? Well, my, my, my acting career got interrupted because I got married and I had a baby, so that took precedence then, so I really stopped acting. Right. But I did start a private school in New York called Sunshine Circle. Okay. We started at Dr. Eugene Callender's okay. uh, church. Uh, my, my, I had a dear friend and I said, I want to start this school. I tried to get my son into, I, I went to look for schools, uh, private schools in New York. He was about two years old and they had no none for black kids. Right. They were all white kids with white teachers and I felt I didn't want my son to go to a school and he didn't see anybody else looking like himself. So I said, well, I'll just start my own school, which I did and I got a friend. I said, Karen Baxter was a dear friend of mine. Uh, and I said, look, I want to start this school. Will you come in with me? Because I always believe two is greater than one. We went to talk to Dr. Eugene Callender. He liked the idea, but he said, but you girls don't have an education degree. I mean, you're not prefer And they said, he said, exactly. That's why we want to start it, because we have to find something for our kids to go to. Yeah. So to make a long story short, I found this building on 145th Street and uh, Amsterdam was one of the worst neighborhoods you could possibly, it was like Junkie Haven at the time. Right. And I went in there and I found this uh, 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 space on the third floor and we, we fashioned it with, we furnished it with pillows and of stuff for kids and that's how it started. And we told friends to bring their, their and it, the, the word of the mouth spread along. We started off with about 15 kids there. Now it's so interesting because in this, in this drug infested neighborhood, in this drug infested building, on the third floor was a methadone clinic mm -hmm. from uh, uh, right down the hall from where our door was. Mm -hmm. And I watched these ladies, these men and women, getting on the elevator day after day with their drug problem exchanging mm -hmm. one drug for another because they, instead of dealing drugs, they got methadone, which is a, another yeah, drug. Right. And um, it was so interesting because when I auditioned for Crash, I patterned that character after those women that I had seen on the elevator. And I, I didn't know that 30 years later, or 20 years later, however long it was, I would use those, those women would be the reason why I auditioned for that role. And I auditioned so well because it was so authentic, because I had had all those years of study watching those women off and on the elevator. So it was pretty cool. So my career took a turn and I was doing that. And then I learned democracy doesn't work in a school system because I made the mistake of telling the parents, look, this is a school that I'm starting, but I want you all to have input. I should have said, if you don't like the school, you go start your own. Because it got written up in Essence. Essence Magazine heard about the school. In fact, Ed Bullens was, a, Ed, uh, Ed Lewis was a friend of mine, and I told him I had started the school, and he came and checked it out, and he loved the concept because I had it like a Montessori school where learning is circular. And uh, you can learn music through art and math through uh, science and all because learning is circular. And uh, Essence, uh, he liked the idea of it and Essence came and checked it out and they wrote a wonderful article about it. And at that, after that, oh my God, all the parents then wanted to take my place. They didn't like what was happening. They started complaining and complaining and I had to decide if I was gonna stay there and fight them from, and work for the school, for my school, that was my brainchild, or if I was going to go, my husband had just gotten a job, but he was working with Sidney Poitier and he was doing something in California if I should uh, stay there or come. To, so right. I decided I would leave the school, leave it to them, and I came to California, and in six months the school had died. Wow. Yeah. I can believe it. Tell us about this new role and sort of how it feels, what things you enjoy, and... About this new role, you mean 911 <laughs> right. new Right, well, role? not completely new role, but <laughs> certainly we haven't seen you in Okay, this. so 911 happened because um, uh, the show was, I think, in its third season, yes. and they were looking for a mom for uh, Angela, and, of course, they wanted people to audition. And I decided I wasn't going to audition because I had done enough work. I felt that they could look at my work and see that I something that I could do and I understand that the networks don't work that way they really want to see you especially if it's a series they want to see you make sure that they're investing their money in somebody that's going to be worth it and uh, so I did I refused to audition and it was they were still looking for several months they were looking and the day 
that I got my, let's see, the day Mary, I won't say who it was, a friend of mine auditioned for it, and she's a wonderful person, she's, she's a good actress, but she doesn't have the experience to do that kind of a role. And I knew they had gotten down to the end of looking for people because, you know, I knew, I knew who she was, and I was saying, wow, well, okay. So the next day I got a call, and they offered me the job, and that's how that started. And of course, the day that I, the, my first day of shooting, all the brass were there because they didn't know what I was going to do. Right. Nobody had seen me do the role, and they were there. I know they were all around the cameras, with, you know, watching and with you know, praying and all that <laughs> kind of stuff, you know. But I killed it. It sure. was great, yeah. You know. Absolutely. Our show is called Music and Medicine. When you hear those words, what does that mean to you? Well, you know, music is medicine, and I know you've heard this a thousand times. Mm -hmm. uh, music is healing. Um, music is the thing that can take you out of one emotion into another. On my ride here, this the girl that drove me here had all this. Oh, she had made her own music reel, mm -hmm. so we had all this different kind of music. Man, we were bopping in the car, and I mean, it was great. So it it and, and it, it it sets you up for for success. It can set you up for failure. Uh, when you have the blues, you can play, you know, music is healing. Sure. And it is medicine because it's the kind of medicine that surrounds your whole body at the same time. Absolutely. In our community, many times healthcare disparities, which really means that sometimes we just don't get the same care as others can occur. And I know we were sharing a story about mm -hmm. how sometimes even a doctor you had seen for a while can overlook things or not take a diagnosis seriously. Yeah. What did you notice? Uh, I, I found out, and I'm so glad you're asking me this because I want other people to know this. I, my son was killed, and I, uh, after that I got high blood pressure. So I've had blood pressure for over 40 years now. And, um, and it's something you can get from high blood pressure or diabetes. I was told, inaccurately I found out, thank God, but that I had kidney problems. And I said, well, what, when did I get stage three, they said. And I said, well, wait a minute, how did it get from stage one to stage two to stage three? I mean, what happened? And I said, all the doctors I've been seeing, I take very good care of myself. I work out, I eat well most of the time. And uh, I don't do a lot of drinking. I used to, but I don't anymore. And by a lot of drinking, I mean, you know, I go out a lot. And when you're younger, you go out and party and everything. Um, and I didn't understand what, why. And um, um, I said, well, why did no other doctor tell me about this? So we went through my other records. I, said, I wanted to know what doctors had neglected to tell me. And they all had neglected to tell me. This is the first doctor in all my years that had told me I had stage three kidney disease. Thank God it turned out that I do not have stage three kidney disease. But there are so many people walking around with the disease that don't know because their doctors don't tell them. I said, why don't doctors tell us that we have stage three kidney disease? My gynecologist told me her husband, who the, we talked about it, and the next time I saw her, her husband was diagnosed with stage four kidney disease, and he's in the field. Right. He wasn't a doctor, but he's in that field. And uh, she, I asked her why, she, she didn't know why, you don't know. So I, I urge people to get a blood test. And when you get your blood test, have your doctor go over it with you and have him tell you every single thing that's on there and have him look at your kidneys and look at your cholesterol and all that. They seem to be uh, better with cholesterol. But first, And I asked the doctor, I said, are you guys in some kind of a chain here? Like you wait till this patient gets this and then you deal with them and when it gets into the next thing, you pass it on to the other doctor until, and then I said, and with this kidney disease, with this kidney disease uh, finally, when it's dialysis time, then that's when the patient knows and that's when they can't do anything about it. Because kidney disease is something you can reverse. You have to change your diet, you have to be very disciplined, but you can reverse it if you want to. And they don't give you the opportunity to participate in your healing. And that's what I think is so wrong. Right. And just to clarify, it sounds like you all were able to kind of get the diagnosis, clarify it, and get treatment done so that you're not dealing with that It currently. wasn't that I got treatment done. I found mm -hmm. out that it, has, it was a wrong diagnosis mm -hmm. because okay. I have a homeopathic doctor that I go to. I don't trust doctors. I shouldn't say that, but I sure. don't. I appreciate and that. And I like second opinions. And so I went back to my homeopathic doctor that's very expensive, but I decided it was worth it because I needed somebody to give me 
to look over everything that all the other doctors were telling me. And when this homeopathic doctor tested me, he saw that if there's a, there's a, they go do it by numbers, yes. but they had inaccurately diagnosed me with stage three kidney disease and I was very thankful. But I still have the same, for, for the most part, I do the same eating habits that I changed to for the kidney disease just in case. Sure. Yeah. No. Well, I so appreciate you telling us that. Yeah. And I want to clarify that point. Hypertension and high blood pressure is very prevalent in the entire country. A lot of it's driven by salt that's added to our food and all processed food and so much food has salt added to it. But it's something we all need to take very seriously. As Ms. Todd was comfortable sharing today, if that continues a long time, high blood pressure that is, it can certainly affect blood flow through the kidneys and people can develop kidney disease. Luckily, she was able to work with her doctors to find out that it was being a bit dramatized. But it is a specific point to note that they have recently, they being um, the American Association of Nephrology, clarified that the lab values that are used for our community, communities of color, the black community, to determine how well your kidney is functioning has actually changed. And that we need to be taken into consideration simply because of our ethnicity. So I encourage you, as does she, to see your doctor, follow up with them regularly, especially if you have hypertension. As she stated, it isn't something we want to continue silently, like she noticed through her OBGYN's doctor, and only be diagnosed when one's pressure is too high in the kidneys to do anything about it besides dialysis. So again, keeping it simple, many of us have high blood pressure and can easily develop it. We have to be much more careful about eating processed foods and foods that have salt, and there are a ton of them that have that, especially if they're not natural fruits and vegetables. And you need to see your doctor each year and make sure you're very well aware, like Beverly pointed out, of exactly what your labs are showing as relates to your kidneys and your overall health. We thank you so much for watching. I've been your host, Dr. Moshe Lewis, and thank you, Beverly, for joining us. Thank you for having me. Welcome to Music and Medicine. Welcome to Music and Medicine. Welcome to Music and Medicine. I'm your host, Dr. Moshe Lewis.